we go. Okay, hello and welcome to our next installment of Lexington Books, uh, Anthropology of Tourism, Heritage, Mobility and Societies, Author Conversation Series. It's a, it's a mouthful, I know. Uh, this is uh, a conversation series we started back in uh, 2020 when everyone was on Zoom. And I'm so happy that a lot of us are not having to be on Zoom all the time. Um, really to kind of give some, some extra uh, discussions and content uh, for the authors of the series uh, that, I, that I run, the Anthropology of Tourism, Heritage, Mobility, and Society. Um, that series uh, provides anthropologists, but not just anthropologists, anybody in the social sciences, authors, of course, uh, and humanities with cutting edge and engaging research on the culture or the cultures of tourism. Uh, you don't need to be an anthropologist to be publishing in uh, this series. In fact, we have several uh, really diverse um, uh, books in the series, some by geographers. Uh, we have, you know, Dean is an anthropologist, but you also do religious studies. Um, we, there's just sociologists. There's, um, I'm trying to look at this, this beautiful, look at how pretty they all look there uh, lined up. Uh, and all these different, um, uh, different varieties and aspects of, of you know, cultural studies basically, right? Um, all you have to do is kind of share and embrace anthropology's holistic and comprehensive approach to scholarship. And, and of course, all of the books in the series, no matter what discipline the authors come from, um, they're sensitive to the complex diversity of human expression. And I mean, tourism, and especially today, we're gonna to be talking about religious tourism and pilgrimage, really capture that, right? And I know uh, my, a lot of my students are on uh, right now, and they've, they have definitely recognized from some of the questions they, they had to submit uh, for this, that, that really you get these diverse expressions right here in the field site that, that we're gonna talk about uh, today. So I'm really pleased uh, to, to uh, have this next installment uh, to talk with um, the author of A Sacred Vertigo, Pilgrimage and Tourism in Rocamador, France. Uh, one of my uh, friends, one of my colleagues, Dina Weibel. Uh, we've, we've had a long history together. We wrote in, in bo different books of each other and series. Um, and it's really great to finally have uh, this book. This is, this is the fruit of really long-term uh, research uh, in, in France. And I know we wanna talk about that. Let me introduce you for a second and you can you can tell me where what I got wrong in your biography or anything. Okay. But you are, <laughs> you're a trained cultural anthropologist, um, you know, that, that you really work in uh, the anthropology of religion, especially on the topics of pilgrimage and tourism and just sacred space in general. And I and I mean that in all the facets of the word space, uh, because some of your most interesting stuff, aside from this, of course, is, is working on space travel and space tourism and pilgrimage as as, as space travel pilgrimage, which is just uh, fantastic stuff. Um, and I see the lines, right? I see a lot of the kind of connections uh, with your, your, your concern with, with space and place in, in, in this book as well. Um, you're the interim chair right now of, of um, well, you're in the Department of Anthropology, but you're also the interim chair and uh, have a joint appointmentship in IRIS, which is the Integrative Religious and Intercultural Studies uh, program and religious studies is, is part of that. And so you teach anthropology and, and religious studies. You also are a co-founder of Roger That, a celebration of space exploration in honor of Roger B. Chaffee, uh, which is this, you know, for several years now, you've been doing this two-day conference uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, or actually since 2017. And, and I hear you were just voted the regional representative of the, the venerable Explorers Club. You're going to put on a pith helmet and start you know, uh, exploring the downtown Chicago, I think. What, are you, what is that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's the Chicago Great Lakes chapter of the Explorers Club. And not yet, but May 1st, I take over. May 1st, you've been roped here. into that. What is the Explorers Club? I just, um, yeah, the Explorers Club is uh, an organization that's been around since 1904. It has a reputation for being very stuffy, pith helmets, old white guys uh, with their cigars and their pipes and this kind of thing. Um, but it's shifted over time. <laughs> I hate to say this because it's kind of embarrassing, but they started allowing women in 1981. So <laughs> there that, you go. Very progressive. Very progressive. And um, it's got a lot of activity with uh, people involved in exploration on Earth, in the water, and also in space. And I got interested in it, not entirely through the space stuff, but some of the space research I've done. Um, a lot of the astronauts that I've known have been involved, and actually one of them wrote me a letter 
to help me get into the club. So um, I felt very pleased to have that opportunity. How could I give that up, right? Yeah, so, of course. Um, it was a really interesting thing. And it's people are interested in all kinds of exploration, any type of field work. Um, some of the folks are really into kind of the more athletic, you know, climbing mountains and, and fjording streams and kayaking and that kind of exploration. And some of us are PhDs who do field work of one type or another. And it's a very interesting blend of uh, folks who get together and um, encourage each other. And there are flag expeditions where people can take the Explorers Club flag to different places. And it's been to the moon and to space multiple times. That's cool, yeah. But you have like, doesn't your family have a big long connection with like exploration or putting, you know, ex ex exhibitions of like oh, Filipino? Boy, we're going to go to this one, are we? <laughs> or, sorry, I didn't mean to throw this curve. No, no, this. you're fine. Um, this is something that I learned more about after I was already an anthropologist. My great grandfather, <clears throat> who is in this picture right there yeah. with the hat, yeah. um, he was recruited by an anthropologist named Albert Jenks to go and uh, recruit a group of Philippine tribes people um, from the Cordillera Mountains, a group known as the Bontoc Igorot. There are different tribal groups among the Igorot and the Bontoc were the ones that he recruited and started up his own exhibition company where he traveled from place to place across the US and in Europe um, somewhat problematically uh, mm -hmm in each location from amusement parks to world's fairs and those kinds of things, the folks that were traveling with him who were men, women, and children of all di different ages um, would build a mock Igorot village. They called sure. them Igoroti villages and they would perform for paying customers. So, you know, different rituals and examples of handicrafts and they would sell things and um, they were paid probably not what they should have been and that was mostly sent back. And uh, Patricia Afable, who's an anthropologist who was at the Smithsonian, um, worked in Yale, uh, studied under Harold Conklin. She um, had been studying them and <clears throat> we came into contact with each other via the magic of email. And I had the family history and she had the, mm -hmm. the, the knowledge of what was going on and we were able to work together on some publications and it's been really interesting but it was a very strange feeling to realize that my great grandparents would never have met if she wasn't a ticket taker in a Chicago amusement park when he was showing the Igorots there so yeah. I owe my very existence to the, the early very troubling days of early anthropology. Hey, that's the original like public anthropology. I mean, you're, you're in the line of Boaz, the World's Fair, in Chicago, and, and all of that, I guess. Yeah, um, not, to, not to make apologies for, you know. Not no, I know. For, there's, you know. There's no way to make it right, but um, it definitely is representative of what a lot of anthropology looked like in 1904, 1905, 1906, you know. Yeah. And so um, I've written on that as well, just because I think it's such a I'm in a weirdly unique position to sure. be able to write both from my discipline and from my family history about right. some sort of darker days in our history. Well, you know, and it's true. And I mean, that's also a jumping off point too, right? I mean, I, I work on pilgrimage as well. And, and as you know, and, and I work in, um, you know, in my, my grandfather's hometown, my mom's was born right outside of the hometown where the Saint uh, Padre Pio is from. And, you know, I've had questions, especially when I was in grad school trying to, you know, do the dissertation research about can you be too close to, you know, what you're studying, right? I mean, it's not really an autoethnography, but you still have these connections, uh, both like material kinship connections, but also just you're not going to visit the other, you know, this weird primitive imagined other you know somewhere you're going to france you're going to france right mm -hmm. i'm going to italy uh to study christian pilgrimages a very western kind of a thing did you did you have it so so this book first of all i should just mention right you're studying a catholic pilgrimage uh site of rocamador um why don't we why don't we ask you to, to explain it a little bit and then let's let we can go on to maybe talking about how you got into it and and your positionality and stuff sure although i'm I smiling at your italicized Version. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's my say, italicized Spanish version. <laughs> yeah. I would say Hocamadur. The, the R's in French are a little more That's like true. German. Yeah. Um, Rocamadur, 
if I, I could say Roca Madur every time, but people would punch me in the face after a while. Mm -hmm. um, Roca Madur is situated in kind of southern central France. It's in kind of a what they refer to as a desert. Being from Southern California, it's not a desert as far as I'm concerned, but mm -hmm. um, it is not very tropical. It's kind of open. There's a lot of uh, open space without growth um, and calcified stuff. And there are these canyons that are cut through by different rivers. And Roque Madur is situated in one of those canyons on the side of a cliff, which is a really, really high cliff. Um, and it is it was built in medieval times. Yeah, that's looking up the side of the cliff. There are different levels to the cliff, but let me back up a little bit. So this started out as a settlement according to the lore where one hermit came and settled in kind of the curve of the cliff. So the cliff isn't up and down, it kind of leans forward like that. And in this kind of shelter in the rock, l'abri shelter, um, apparently he had a statue of the Virgin Mary, a black Madonna statue. I have a, you can kind of see it behind. I can see it back by your book, right? Yeah, this one. And um, that statue is at least a thousand years old. It's never been carbon dated, but it's been, mentioned in, in continuous existence since then. Um, and the story goes that it became a place of pilgrimage after this one devoted hermit was there. Some people associate him with Zacchaeus from the Bible. Um, it's interesting, you've probably seen this in Italy, but in European legends, it's like everybody ever mentioned in the Bible came to Europe after mm -hmm. right. Jesus died. So you have this mass influx into Europe, which I'm not sure we have any evidence of, but um, that's how the story goes. So right around um, the 11th century, it began to pick up popularity as a site. There were different monasteries that battled over who was gonna have the chance to own it and manage it. Um, it became really, really important in the 13th and 14th centuries. And one of the largest pilgrimages in Europe during that time. And there's some interesting stuff um, where as Jerusalem became off limits because of its changing possession and being fought over during the Crusades, European pilgrimages sort of took up the slack and for Europeans anyway. And um, so it became really incredibly popular uh, associated with this wooden statue of the Virgin Mary, um, associated with a bell that hangs in the main chapel that was supposed to ring whenever um, sailors in danger prayed to the Virgin mm -hmm. Mary and she intervened and the monks would write down when it would ring and then wait for the sailors to show up, um, you know, a few months later. And it really picked up. And then you have a series of wars. Um, I don't wanna to go too far into the history and I'm not a historian anyway, but attempts were made to burn the place down. Um, there were landslides where buildings were destroyed and had to be rebuilt. And you end up with the resurgence in the 19th century right around the same time where um, other Marian apparitions were happening. Roque Madur is not associated with an apparition, not like Lourdes or Fatima or other places, but um, it, it kind of seems to have picked up on that time period where the Virgin Mary and devotion to her were becoming much more popular once again sure. in the 1800s. And so it kind of rode that wave. Um, they built a new castle on top, which is not, congruent um, architecturally with the rest of the site. It's kind of a mishmash of eras, but it's all built on the side of a cliff. And what's fascinating about the level, the different levels, the bottom level is mostly where you will find houses. And nowadays you'll find hotels and restaurants. Um, there's actually a nightclub. And then you get to the middle level, that's where the churches are. And some of the churches, there are seven of them total, but um, three or four of them are built so that the cliff wall is actually the fourth face, the fourth wall. So when you go into those, like the chapel and the basilica, you'll have an ordinary wall, an ordinarily ordinary wall, another ordinary wall, and then the cliff. And if it rains, you can have rain coming down that well. Um, yeah. It's stained and lumpy. And um, it's kind of fascinating to have to be like in nature, but also in a constructed building simultaneously, which is a draw for a lot of folks who aren't necessarily Catholic. 
Um, in the 20th century, it became much more of a tourist site. There were a lot more railroads that were put up um, throughout France and throughout the rest of Europe. Becoming a tourist was more of a thing. And over the 20th century, the late 20th century, it sort of lost its predominantly religious characteristic and became much more um, touristy. And when I started doing research there way back in 1995, um, it was in this sort of crisis mode, um, which it hasn't really left, where tourists and tourism were the main way the people there make their money and survive. And um, the religious aspects were downplayed because France is not necessarily the most religious country in Europe. It's right. very much not. Yeah. And so um, that combination of that tension where you have people working and living there who want it to be a secular site with the pilgrimage relegated to the past, you know, some kind of quaint thing that we remember there used to be a pilgrimage here. But at the same time, there are still active pilgrimages, um, different clergy with different attitudes about pilgrimage and wanting to bring it back, wanting to relegate it to the past, wanting to make tourism come in. Um, and so it's kind of the classic contested site. If your students have studied how contestation is one of the you know, things that gets discussed about pilgrimage, it really fits into that model of who's supposed to be here. Why is the site important? Um, who lays claim to it? Who tells you what it is, et cetera? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, what I like about this, I mean, it really is a microcosm of, of so many uh, aspects of especially Catholic pilgrimage sites in, in Europe. I mean, it's not one that I uh, always knew about, um, uh, I have to say, but it does seem so much like those secondary pilgrimage, not to, not to diminish, but, you know, these kind of secondary pilgrimage sites that are Marian, but they're old school Marian. They're, they're, you know, I think this, just like a lot of cave, I mean, uh, cave and, and mountain structures uh, were, were probably deemed uh, sacred, pre-Christian, you know, mm -hmm. pre-Christianity, oh, yeah. right? I mean, you get this great day, like, you know, Iliadi, you know, Marseille Iliadi, the great uh, mythographer and, and uh, you know, comparative religions um, uh, expert would say that the axis mundi of, the, of, of, of any religion, of any culture is these, these uh, landforms, right? These unusual mm -hmm. landforms are the things that really draw people to this. That's where the sacred erupts out of the everyday. And I mean, it, it definitely seems uh, from the way that you described it just now and the way you described in the book that 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 Roca, Roca is, uh, you know, is, a very, is, is, is one of those kinds of classic sites. Do we know what was there before? What you, you said there were troglodytes, and, you know, like these. Yeah, I mean, there were definitely people living in caves. There's La, La Grotte des Merveilles, the, the Grotto of Marvels, which is a tourist attraction there that's been there for mm -hmm. um, early, early 1900s, maybe even late 1800s. I'm trying to remember the dates. Um, but yeah, people lived there for sure. It, the, the idea that it was a place of worship pre-Christian times, I think is widely accepted. Um, there are some, and it was frustrating to me that they've never had the Black Madonna, um, you know, dated because it would be interesting to know just how old that statue is. Um, but the argument that I've heard from some pilgrims and some authors is that these dark Madonna statues, the black Madonna statues may have been reworkings of goddess figurines that were associated with fertility, the dark color representing dark rich earth. And it's not a super fertile area. So, I mean, there are some farms, but it's not, it, it's much more grazing land. There are a lot of goats and sheep and, and folk and animals like that around. Um, so maybe they needed the fertility goddesses to sort of get it to work. But um, it's been associated with um, several different pre-Christian goddesses. And I always get messed up because the names don't always get pronounced um, correctly by my interlocutors. So there's one I was told to pronounce as Chibeli, but I think Sibel is actually the more common. Sibel, yeah. Sibel, yeah. yeah. So that goddess is associated with the site, and there are several others. Yeah, the Sibyls were, they were seers, they were like a fortune seers, but they right. had divine, divine seers, right? And they lived in caves often, I think. So that's that, that idea, the, the caves. Um, but of course, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, the big, the big kind of 
regional pilgrimage site that my mother grew up going to. And that was the thing that we always talked about was not to Padre Pio or to Samarian. I mean, it was a Marian site, but you know, it was this thing called Monte Vergine, which is a black Madonna mm -hmm. on a mountain in the, in the province of Avellino uh, near, near Naples. And I mean, that for us would be, as a growing up too, that was the big site, right? And then now it's, I mean, it's actually kind of very much like Rocco Maduro in that it's not really something that's known maybe as widely as it used to be in the Middle Ages, right? Yeah. But Rocco Maduro's got an interesting connection to two other major pilgrimages, Lourdes. It's kind of hmm. like the forgotten little stepsister of Lourdes hmm. where um, it always gets compared to Lourdes yeah. and well, it's both in southern France right too right and, and so I mean there was I participated on a pilgrimage with um the diocese uh, diocese of Caux and Rocamadour to go to Lourdes and that was kind of interesting because they brought their own flag of their own Madonna Flags, yeah. and that kind of uh connection between the Madonnas is fascinating to me and then the other one is um the Santiago de Compostela route mm -hmm. And oh, look what I'm drinking out of. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Santiago. Yeah, Saint Jacques de Compostelle. And I don't know if you can see it, but the the statue I have behind me, um, it's made from scrap metal. Um, that's, you know, kind of the, the typical pilgrim, but you'll see a lot of Santiago pilgrims coming to Rocamadour and staying there. And it's not on either, it's not on any of the routes. So a lot of people are familiar with the main route through Spain. There are actually four major routes in France that kind of converge, and Rocamadour is between two of those. Mm. So a lot of times when I would talk to pilgrims who were Compostela pilgrims, they would have just detoured to Rocamadour without really even realizing it had a religious significance. But apparently the monks at Conk in particular were sending people to Rocamadour. Oh. Um, and so there was a lot of like, like Camino hopping like going from one type, uh, one part of the path to the next part of the path and Rocamadour benefited from that. Um, so, but it was kind of weird to find people going, oh, I thought I was taking a break from pilgrimage. You have pilgrimage? <laughs> so, Every place is pilgrimage in yes. France. And <laughs> yeah, no, so, but it was an intentional kind of a break, right? Like they would have to intentionally oh, leave yeah. the, the, the Camino. They would leave the path. Right. And sometimes they were just like, oh, I've heard about this place. It's supposed to be pretty. And then just be shocked that there was a pilgrimage there as well. And so sure. I actually wrote a conference paper about that once where people were like a pilgrim and then they weren't. And then they were like, oops, I'm a pilgrim again. And then they weren't. And then they were a pilgrim again. Right. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, that's a that's a perfect question. I mean, a lot of the students had questions about this. This is something that comes up a lot in your book is, uh, you know, number one, the multifaceted aspect of the site itself and how you it, how it tries to be all things for all people mm -hmm. in a way that's at least what I got out of it but but another one and, and I think we can go to this let's just say you're a pilgrim right can people occupy different um uh identities of being uh secular and sacred being a pilgrim and a tourist um all at once uh what is the divide you know, that's another kind of question we could we could talk about. What's the difference between a pilgrim and a tourist? Yeah, that, uh, that's a really hard one. I was very hard my, my own students a, a film about uh, Hajj, and there's a scene where everybody stops and gets uh, ice cream at Baskin Robbins, and mm -hmm. what's happening now? So I think a lot of it has to do with intentionality and moments of, you know, what, what you're thinking at the time. I almost feel like you're a pilgrim if you are meaning to be a pilgrim at that moment, or if you have a moment that kind of sweeps you away. Um, the 1990s management of uh, the shrine at Roque Maduro, the priests were very much, they didn't want to proselytize to the pilgrim, but there was this sort of understanding, and I talk about this in the book, that it could hit you at any time and they nobody would have to talk to you, but you would just be so moved by the location that you would become a pilgrim. Mm -hmm. And um, they use um, Francis Poulenc as kind of the example of that. He was a composer, wildlife, absolutely wildlife. He was um, this amazing composer, wrote this very, how do I put this? Music with a lot of minor chords, music that's very like, atmospheric but also disturbing um had this life of you know bisexual relationships 
Um, he had a good friend of his die in a car crash. He went to Roque Medor's kind of a retreat, had this experience in the chapel where he just said it was like a lightning strike. He was converted. He wrote the litanies to the Black Virgin, um, which are from, you know, based on Roque Medor. Really interesting music if you have a chance to listen to it. And then he continued his, his life having his relationships, but then occasionally having these breakdowns where he would get stigmata. And really? yeah, and it was one of those things where the in the 90s, the priests, they were really interested in like playing him up because he was a celebrity associated and he was somebody who would come as a tourist but left as a pilgrim. Mm -hmm. And um, not everything about his life was picture perfect, saintly convert. Mm -hmm. And so some people were willing to overlook that for the story and other people were like, eh, he's really not, you know, the exemplar that we should be sure. focusing on. But I mean, that's so typical of a lot of saints, right? I mean, you have the ones that are the exemplar and saints are supposed to be exemplars, right? But at the same time, there were those redemptive, all those saints that were, I mean, St. Paul, for example, I mean, yeah. he was persecuting and then the redemption is the thing we're supposed to be uh, following the example of. But in the 90s, he was like, why you don't try to convert tourists? Because they will convert on their own if they're meant to convert. And um, that changed, you know, they're, as the management of the um, religious aspects of the town changed, the idea of who you should be, you know, should you reach out to tourists? Should you be overtly religious here? Did you hide the rituals or should you put the religion, the rituals in the public sphere? And um, that was interesting to watch change over the years where as things in France became more conservative um, and the priests running Roque Medor became conservative, the approaches to religious ritual and how to present religion at the site changed. Yeah. I mean, I could see this kind of, you know, Roque Medor has gone through a lot of these 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 fluctuations or these movements um, of, of um, increases of pilgrimage and religiosity and then decreases. I mean, like you said, uh, Middle Ages, it was really big. And then it kind of had that, which all of Europe had that kind of collapse and the enlightenment and, and all that. But then the 1800s, I mean, you know, Catholic historians would call it the, the Marian century, late 1800s to the, to the mid 1900s, um, precisely because of the Cold War, really, like, the, you know, the, the growth of of science uh, supplanting, although science doesn't have to be in, in, um, compatible with, with religion, and, and I would argue it isn't, but certainly these, these nationalistic movements, you know, taking away land from the Vatican and, and things, and then, um, you know, World War I and this, you know, Soviet Union and, and communism, uh, you really had that this boom in, in apparitions. Uh, but then 1990s, Soviet Union falls, and so, you know, you can, you can pull back a little bit on that again. You know, we right. don't have as many uh, apparitions anymore. We still have, you know, Medjugorje. The kids are still, well, now they're adults, still still seeing the Virgin, but um, you don't have it in the intensity like you did, especially in that region, right? Southern France, Northern Spain, you had Gata Bandal. You have, if you go to, all the way to Portugal, you know, you have Fatima. You, I mean, you have all these, uh, these great, great areas. Um, of that so but you're right now i think there is so there is now a shift a little bit uh towards conserve more conservative i mean obviously yeah. french society is uh you know we we're, we're right now talking the election, about yeah the polls um yeah there's there's a shift yes yeah. um i was there with a student in 2014 and it, that was the first election um where what they were called then at the time le, le front national just really took off um and that was kind of shocking to see but um i was i had a thought and i think it just fell out of my head um but yeah the more conservative i talk about um the rise in charismatic christianity and i don't know how much that has affected italy but there is that that big you know movement as well from probably the early 2000s i want to say late 90s yeah, I would say yeah. late 90s makes sense for when I saw it yeah. starting um, in France anyway. And that's become much more popular with this idea of the presence of the Holy Spirit and direct sort of unmediated contact mm -hmm. with um, the divine where it's... Protestantization of... Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> and so, but it's not Protestant, you know, 
that that was one of the debates some of the nuns were having it was like is this a protestant thing or is this not a protestant thing sure. and i was trying to figure it out too as a graduate student who was unfamiliar um with this movement that was coming through and just learning about it so yeah the the priest that i refer to as father tristan um very charismatic and charismatic simultaneously young um at the time in the 90s he was still in his late 20s early 30s um good looking royal um you know the, the french got rid of their royal family but it still matters if you're um of royal blood so mm -hmm. he managed to kind of ring all these bells and of course there's an association between some conservative french and the monarchy and like it all kind of ties in together yeah yeah so tell me a little bit so so part of the 90s marketing strategy when maybe there was a decline a little bit in um marianism and in and in uh religiosity they start the the, the site managers uh who are those site managers too and, is the question yeah and thank you for yeah. that yeah might as well these site managers are, are then turning a little bit more towards tourism which we would think of as, a, as more of a secular kind of uh, mobility but what uh yeah what can you say about that who are these site managers who's making the decisions and then what is the difference between tourism and, and, and pilgrimage in that sense? How are they shifting from one to another? Yeah, there were there were different people um, trying to run things. One thing that's important to learn about Rocamadour is by the 1990s, when I was there, it stopped being able to be a real town. Um, and what I mean by that is a normal little French town is going to have a butcher and a baker, and they're going to have a place where you can shop, and they're going to have all of these other things. And for Rocamadour, it became um, so important to have touristic businesses mm -hmm. that the markets were either off-site completely, like you know, five kilometers away, where you can't just like it basically became a food desert, in mm -hmm. to use contemporary terminology. And then um, sometimes food trucks would come in. So during the winter months, you know, meat trucks would come in once a week, and you could buy meat. But um, it was not a normal town because everybody had to be in the tourist business. And so there were a few people who weren't like, but they might be like house cleaners or, um, you know, the school teacher in town, they did have a school, but most people either ran stores or restaurants or hotels or were clergy, you know, and it, it became right. this whole thing. Um, and so, I think a lot of the, there were different groups who had an influence. So it's not like there's one manager who's making the decisions for everything. You had um, the merchants and for the merchants, it was really important for most of them for the site to be secular because they wanted people to come in and have a good time and have a beer and buy some souvenirs. And um, that became really important. And in the 70s, I don't think we've talked about this part yet, a uh, park opened up called Le Forêt des Singes, the monkey park or the monkey forest. And it was a very improbably a troop of Barbary macaques that were brought in and set up in a forested area near the shrine, um, you know, like a mile away. And you go and you get popcorn when you go in and you feed the monkeys and they roam around and Rocamadour is monkeys, which doesn't have anything to do with uh, it's history. And then um, a few years after that, they opened um, uh, Le Rocher des Aigles, which is uh, Eagle's Rock. It is uh, another park, an animal park, but devoted to birds of prey, which kind of works because, you know, falcons and hawks, and that's all very medieval. Mm, sure, sure. Um, but they also became like an association with Rocamadour. And so people would come for the animal parks, they would come for um, there was an exhibit with bees, there was something called the Ferry Railroad, um, all of these different sort of secondary attractions that were, people were drawn to the cliff and drawn to the architecture of the cliff. The churches are part of that architecture, but you could have a complete experience at Rocamadour that didn't even take the churches into account. Mm -hmm. And that's what the merchants were counting on. They wanted those types of tourists to come in. And they didn't want overt religiosity because it was a distraction from the tourism and often made people feel uncomfortable. So I talk in the book about um, a procession that I took part in where we went through the main village where the restaurants and shops are and people were just like 
<laughs> this watching us go by. <laughs> and it was very much a sense that you were disturbing somebody's holiday. It would be like, imagine trying to have a religious uh, ritual in the middle of a Las Vegas casino. No. People wouldn't like it. it seemed anachronistic. Or out right. Of Why is this happening here? But at the same time, the, the merchants did like the idea of the medieval pilgrim. That was fine because that was cute and distant and you didn't have to worry about that. At the same time, you had um, the, the diocese, which owned... Mm -hmm some of the stores on the church level that were religious stores. They're like, you go in and you buy a new Bible and you buy rosaries and you buy statues and you know, it's a typical Catholic store. And um, then they would also have the museum that was a religious museum. And they were trying to say, look, this is still a living religious site. You can still come to mass here. You can still have, you know, events, bring your, bring your diocese and come and visit as pilgrims. And so trying to keep that going. And um, because the site is vertical and you would start at the bottom and go up to the top if you wanted to have the whole experience or start at the top and go to the bottom, the only walking way was to go through the church courtyard. And that became a bone of contention um, in a lot of ways. Other site managers where that became important were tour guides. So the, um, the diocese themselves had religious tour guides. And then the town had a secular tourist office and right. would offer tours, but what they had in their tours were very different from each other. Mm -hmm. So the secular tours couldn't actually, the tour guide could not go into the churches with the tourists. They would have to go through that church courtyard because it's unavoidable unless you take the elevators, which you have to pay for. Um, but the religious tour guides would go into the churches and give the full history of it. And different approaches to that tended to, you know, refocus the site. Um, one of the tour guides I spoke to would talk about, you know, she would judge sort of the group she was with, how much religious information she wanted to give them, sure. or she wanted to leave it out. And, um, but I remember there was a scandal where one of the secular tour guides took shelter between two of the churches during a rainstorm and got in trouble for it mm. because they weren't even supposed to go up the stairs to where you could enter the churches. And that's where they had taken shelter. But that seems so, so strange uh, to me in a way, because especially because it's the, the history, the heritage, if you want to talk about the, the secular cultural heritage uh, of the place uh, really has to do with this, this, being a pilgrimage site and the Black Madonna and these churches architecturally and, mm -hmm. and historically. And I mean, certainly in a lot of places that I've seen, I mean, the secular tour guides would, would be allowed and would come in, especially if they paid, to, to take them in to see the frescoes or to see the, the art in the church. Um, and they were, they're not allowed to do that. I mean, and, and, is that a, and then that's something that was a bone of contention between the the, 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 the mayor and the pro loco, we call it in Italian, the, the, the tourist, the tourist board, right. and then the, then the, the church and the, the diocese. Yeah, that, and it was bitter. It I mean, there was a lot of uh, fighting about that kind of thing, especially in the 1990s. One of the stories I tell is the, the curate was like, okay, I've, I'm going to put my foot down. We keep having these tourists come through, and it's disrespectful. They bring their dogs because right. French tourists always have dogs. And um, that's an overgeneralization, but it's pretty- They're awesome. smoking and they have the dog. Yeah. <laughs> so to um, say as Italians only, we don't have dogs. <laughs> and then immodest clothing, because Rocamadour gets very hot, like in the 90s, yeah. hundreds in the summer. And then trash cans. They didn't want trash cans in the church courtyard because mm -hmm. they considered them to be unsightly. And so you ended up with the curate saying, you know, you can't have this. You cannot, if people are gonna go through the church courtyard, they can't bring their dogs and they have to be dressed modestly. And the, the merchants and the hoteliers and the restaurateurs just had a fit because they need people to circulate between the shops at the top of the cliff and the sh shops at the bottom of the cliff. Mm. Yeah. And to cut that off to people with dogs or people wearing shorts. Uh, and so finally the priest had to relent. And the only thing he was able to get um, on his list was no trash cans, which meant people were leaving trash on, in the church courtyard or going into the pilgrimage store looking for trash cans or going to the museum and looking for trash cans. It was not a good solution. But when the later um, priest came, the conservative charismatic priest, 
that was when suddenly there were, you know, you could not get into the church unless you had the little modesty cloths to cover mm, your legs sure. and cover yeah. your shoulders. And that was the first time I had ever seen that in Roque Lador. And um, having religious rituals in public, like next to a public parking lot during a secular cheese festival so that tourists who were there for the cheese festival would know that by God, this is a sacred site. This is a religious site. This is what we do here. Um, and that was really interesting to see that tension and who controls what and how that message was constantly shaped and reshaped by different folks. But when it was secular, the religious stuff was disturbing. It was overly conservative and it was considered distracting by the secular business owners. That's interesting. Um, I guess in that way, I, you could you could differentiate. My next question is kind of how do you differentiate? I mean, between a pilgrim and a tourist, because there is it, usually we would say it's on a spectrum in some way. But I guess it's like which um, who you choose to do business with, basically. And, you know, the tour guide, like who's going to take you in and what's their affiliation and, and you know, what, what's their, their topic, basically. Um, but, you know, you you do talk and, and this in this book kind of. Um, references a term that you use in, in, in other in, in some of the other um, uh, works that you have you've uh, published uh, in this you have Catholics of course but you have then what you call religious creatives right um, what are what is that what are who are religious creatives and where do they fall among in the spectrum yeah this cut really interesting to me when I started doing this uh, field work in the 90s when I was in graduate school because I had been looking for, you know, a chance to talk to some, you know, serious pilgrims. And I finally saw this couple who were going up the big staircase to get from the bottom to the middle level. And they were taking it on their knees and they wow. were citing the Lord's Prayer and the Hail Mary. And they were going back and forth. And I thought, Catholic pilgrims, like, this. so the real, you know, I was like, real deal. Yeah, maybe a month into my field work. <laughs> and I went up and started talking to them after they were done. And they were like, yes, well, this is a, Rokmador is a point of energy where the earth can exchange energy with pilgrims. And the problem with this place is the tourists because they're stealing energy, but not contributing anything back. And they showed me the sacred places and how they formed the letter M and for Mary and how these nodes of earth were really important. And I was like, this is interesting. So I was living with the nuns at the time and I ran back and I was like, so nodes of energy. And they're like, yeah, those aren't Catholic pilgrims. <laughs> um, got a lot of, well, that's not in catechism. No, I, I figured it wasn't in catechism. Um, but then when I found out that those types of pilgrims would come, those types, um, the French use the word um, esoteric, uh, esoteric pilgrims or seekers or, yeah, um, big one. yeah. Sociologists use that. Yeah, for sure. And um, very much in the 90s, when the New Age movement was very big, there was a lot of alignment with New Age period. Also, a lot of folks who would be considered earth-based religions like neo-pagan and Wiccan, where uh, the pattern that I noticed in common was the belief that all religions are equally true in their pure forms. So if a religion seemed like a real outlier, that meant that it had been you know, gone through some problematic history, usually by humans messing around with it. Um, all religions were true. They're all paths to the same thing. Um, often given a metaphor of a pyramid having, you know, the, the point on the top, but you could go up all kinds of different walls to get to the top of the pyramid. And because all religions were true, one of the things I saw in practice um, with these groups, and I did go on pilgrimage with one group, um, was if you are attracted to a particular religious practice, belief, image, symbol, that should be incorporated into your own personal form of worship. Oh. And so the Black Madonna statue was really important for a lot of, uh, especially the group I was with who were um, Wiccan pilgrims, all former Christians of one type or another, they were like, I would say mostly former Catholics with a few former Protestants. For the former Catholics, the um, 
Black Madonna statues were extremely important. Interestingly, for the former Protestants, they, you know, okay, whatever. But um, this idea that it was a pre-Christian goddess was very important um, because then it became something that had been incorporated into Christianity, but never truly Christian. Um, but in other cases, the idea of the Virgin Mary is one of the manifestations of a larger goddess figure who could manifest as, you know, Lakshmi or manifest as Kuan Yin or manifest in a number of different ways with the Virgin Mary being one of those manifestations. Um, but I would find that for those folks, Rocamadour became really important because a couple reasons. Number one, it had symbols that could be, you know, that were important to individual pilgrims that could be used in their own practice but also because the underlying idea about sacred sites was this idea of nodes of energy that I'd been first introduced to. And that turns out to be very, very common. Some of uh, the people will be familiar with ley lines and the idea of certain sites as having energy. Um, and so that turns out to be a really strong belief among certain populations in Europe, including a lot of French pilgrims who are doing pilgrimage in France where places like Montségur or Carcassonne are also seen as these strong energy sites. And then it becomes really interesting because you have sites that are spiritually important that can have an effect on a person's soul. I was told that I was lucky I'd spent so much time in Rocamadour because it would make my soul evolve. Hmm. Um, but it also, that energy is decoupled from any particular religious tradition which means that you could have a Catholic shrine or you could have a Buddhist temple or you could have uh, a shrine to Sibele um, or Sibel in the same place. And what's important is that underlying energy. It's just the variety of different religious responses to it, which are all equally valid. And so Rocamadour was attracting a lot of folks there who were really drawn to the cliff really drawn to the Black Madonna, really drawn to the pre-Christian history, mm. and drove the nuns absolutely berserk. <laughs> no, but, but uh, it seems like, uh, do you kind of, um, do you share that kind of uh, an idea? Because I, there's this, I, I pulled out a quote uh, <laughs> that, that seems to support something of what you were saying on page seven here. It says that the assumptions I bring to this monograph or that religious beliefs are formed in human communities as part of a learned culture, but may be influenced by underlying cognitive structures that give rise to awe and similar feelings under certain physical conditions. The secular travel of these types of locations can evoke similar subjective experiences, but that I guess prior priming can lead to very different interpretations of these experiences. Almost like there's like an archetypical kind of a thing that we share certain things and it's just kind of what category, you know, culture makes us think in certain categories and everything else, worldview does that. Mm -hmm. um, we just kind of interpret those inputs differently or something. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know that I'm, I would go so far as to say, you know, this energy that gets interpreted in different ways, but I can see the parallel. And one of the things that, and maybe you're heading toward this, is Rocamadour is really freaky to be in because it's vertical, because you're either looking up at something, you're looking down. There's this constant sense that something's gonna fall on you or you're going to fall off something. And it it's a weird place to be. You don't, getting back to the space stuff, it, right. it's one of the few places I've visited where a lot of the movement is in three dimensions rather than in two dimensions. So just like an astronaut can kind of float up and down and side to side and back and forth. In Rocamadour, there's much more up and down than you would see because you're very limited back and forth and you have to go up and down and there's this constant connection. And so I think what I was talking about in that quote is not so much a mysterious energy, at least I don't think I was, but um, this sense of weirdness or unease that's brought about by the physical proximity of the cliff in this location. And that, that, these, that the geography of a pill, I mean, what I like about this, and I mean, it goes all the way to your title, right? Uh, what I like about this is um, that you really do pay very close attention to geography or, or maybe we should say spatiality because your yeah. work in space travel too is, is, is related to this. That you know, there there are certain structures, just the structural quality of the place. Maybe it has energy, maybe it doesn't, but it should be paid attention to. You know, do you 
kind of agree with that or? Yeah, I absolutely do. Because I've been to other sites where this wasn't an issue. Um, Lords is pretty flat. Um, there are mountains That's around water. it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> right. Um, the Pyrenees are right there, but there's not a lot of use of them in ritual. Sure. Um, you've got, on uh, the other hand, a lot of Asian sacred sites are built on top of, you know, very difficult places to reach that part of the pilgrimage is actually dealing with the, the problem of getting there. Uh, I mentioned Meteora. Um, in yeah. Greece. Yeah. Although that one's a little different because they're like on top, right? So you have the plateaus and then you have the, the sacred buildings on top. With Rokumadur, they're clinging in a weird way. There's something mm. about that clingingness that you never get mm. security that it's not going to fall. <laughs> and there really were, I mean, I had nightmares sometimes because I would hear stories about snakes falling on people from the top of the cliff. You're just minding your own business and a snake lands on you. Yeah. Um, and I was, there were snakes for sure, um, but usually not falling on you. I saw people fell when I was there, dogs fell when I was there. Fortunately, um, nobody fell to their death, but rocks would fall and land on people's cars. Mm. So it was very much this awareness that you're in this constant danger. And when the church itself isn't on top of something stable, like built on a rock, instead it's built against the rock. Gosh, I should have mm. put that in the book. Um, it, I think there's almost this anxiety that gets produced or this sense of numinousness. Mm. Um, and the term that got used a lot by everybody was this idea of um, énergie tellurique, telluric energy, um, um, which is energy in the earth. And the folk story associated with it was that there were these rivers of energy that started in um, Belgium and continued underground and Rokemadur is where they would burst forth. And so you were constantly bathed in this weird energy, which is why Rokemadur seems so sacred, but also made even secular people feel like there was something weird that's going mm -hmm. on there. Mm -hmm. And I can't prove it, but I think the cliff and how the cliff is can contribute to some of that. Right. So, yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, we, I, I was telling you before we started this, I mean, I just got finished teaching about spirit possession and, and ritual and, and things <laughs> like that. And, and, you know, uh, we, people see things differently, right? I mean, we see things in one way and other people can see it at the same, the same site especially if you're from a different culture in a very different way, we pull things out uh, differently. And, and it's not to say that that um, a site like this doesn't have a particular kind of energy, I don't think. Yeah, know, I mean, I would say that. like spirit possession is a great example because if you're in a culture that believes in spirit possession, you're taught to expect it. You're taught to look for signs of it. Yep, yep. And I might have a feeling that I don't associate with spirit possession, but somebody over there, if they see that as a sign of, you know, a demon attacking them or a sign of the Holy Spirit entering them, they're going to say, oh, this is happening to me. And if they believe that this thing is happening to them, then that's going to lead to the next cognitive right. thing uh, and maybe some physical things. So that's kind of like if you're primed for spirit possession, right. then certain things are going to indicate that that's happening. Right. And I think if you're primed for a spiritual experience, I, you know, oh my gosh, I feel odd. That might be kind of that entry point. Do you ever see uh, pilgrims? Have you ever heard of anyone seeking miracles or some sort of miraculous interventions at, at this site? I mean, certainly at Padre Pio, I mean, it happens all the time. People smell them, you know, they're always praying for miracles, um, but he's a different kind of saint. It's less common. Um, I think this is interesting. They do have stuff that was left by people who associate Rocamador um, with miraculous healings. And there have been examples, not a ton, like it's like, the priests could, you know, name maybe half a dozen in the last decade that they would really count, but they kept them locked away in closets. It was not something like they were put on display. Mm. Um, the only uh, ex votos that were common, you know, in the open area were really old ex votos. Mm -hmm. So ships that were left by sailors, you know, model ships that mm -hmm. can hang from the inside the uh, chapel, or in some cases. Um, they probably do this in Italy too, but the marble 
plaques where mm -hmm. it's thank sure. you, you know, for this. And they have a whole row of those, but um, objects that were given or thank you notes or that kind of witnessing uh, about healing, it happened, but it was not really publicized, um, at least yeah. during the time when I was doing my dissertation field work. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess the natural question that would be, you know, we're, we're in this endemic COVID period. I mean, we had a couple of years, you, you published this, you wrote this during, co you know, during the yeah. quarantines and everything. And I know you weren't able to get back, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but do you have any sense of how, how Rokumador fared during? Uh, I think from quarantine? what I can tell um, from, you know, online connections, mm -hmm. um, it seems like it's back to kind of normal and it was back to kind of normal as soon as the vaccines were made available. But um, most of it's out, outdoors. Mm -hmm. So looking through um, social media and other things about the early days, everything shut down. There were prayers for healing. Um, there were Zoom, you know, the kinds mm -hmm. of stuff people were doing uh, throughout the Western world for sure. And then it became like, well, as long as you wear a mask and then it got hot. Um, it's fascinating to read sort of the Yelp reviews of different things because <laughs> It's like, it's fine, but nobody was enforcing the mask requirement. Boy, that sounds really familiar. Um, <laughs> so it went from being pretty dead in the springtime of 2020 to quite packed by uh, July and August. August is the big vacation month in sure. France. Yeah. So it sounded like it was just really almost back to normal in August with mask wearing and then the vaccine that helped. Um, my impression is that it's as normal as it can be at the moment mm -hmm. that they've weathered this pretty well. Yeah. Um, one of the nice things about Rocamador is it's just such a stunningly beautiful site. And I'm going to say that without any sense of being um, objective. It's just a really beautiful, beautiful, stunning site that people want to go there. People want to visit it. People enjoy being there. They mm -hmm. enjoy that, the, the feeling of being there. Um, my mom came in the nineties and she's like, not religious at all. She's like, I don't know. I just feel something. Mm. And she'll even say that now she's 88 and she'll be like, yeah, I remember going there. I really felt something. Mm. And I think that's fascinating. Meanwhile, when my son was, uh, quite young, he went and, uh, I guess he was 10 and he just looked up. He's like, wow, I feel dizzy. And <laughs> <laughs> like, that's something <laughs> yeah that's something I feel my legs hurt I don't want to walk anymore <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty good about the staircase the staircase is quite a challenge but <laughs> just that oh my gosh you know you look down and you're like oh no and you look up and you're like oh no that's I had one friend who went out on the ramparts these are 13th century ramparts to go out over the cliff um into the canyon and she was shaking so hard from I mean, just that fear of heights. I guess I, it can, it's like this weirdly combination of fear inspiring and beautiful. And that's kind of what awe is, right? Right, yeah. So it, I think it's really good at invoking awe. And I think because of that, um, it's not going to disappear. It's not going to, I think it, it has staying power, it has legs. So even if, you know, Christianity a thousand years from now, who knows something new is taken over. It's still going to be a really important place. Yeah. Yeah. Reason. Yeah. So is that, is that what drew you to it? I mean, why did you start doing this uh, research? Here? <laughs> um, I, I it came to it through the visual. I studied uh, French throughout high school and I studied it in, as an undergraduate as well. I actually was a French major when I started as an undergraduate. And um, I got into grad school and I wanted to do research at a sacred site. I grew up four miles from Disneyland. So I know from living near a sacred site. Um, and I wanted to know if the people there were religious, were they not religious? How did they feel about it? And that was kind of my first focus. And I was trying to figure out where to go. And I wanted like a sacred place. And my doctoral chair, uh, David K. Jordan, um, he, snuck a postcard of Roca Madur in my graduate mailbox. And he'd been there recently. And I was like, what's this? He's like, oh, it's just a sacred place I thought you might be interested in. I'm like, it's in France. Can I do anthropology in France? And he said, do they have people in France? <laughs> 
oh my gosh, I could do anthropology in France. So I was really drawn to it. I did a three week uh, kind of reconnaissance trip in 1995, all by myself, the first time I'd ever been to Europe mm -hmm. um, and spent about 12 days at Lourdes and about a week at Rocamadour and then finished it up in Paris. And I got to know those nuns at Rocamadour during those days there. And they said, come back and That's stay great. with us and do your research. And so it just laid out in front of me. Yeah, well, that's great. And I mean, you know, what I like about the book is that it really is based on, just like our previous talk uh, with Lynn Bullis uh, on, on a many decades worth of experience here, right? So you get, it's a, it's a shorter book. I mean, it's not like a big tome, right. but you get this big, big idea, you know, this, this, this like this good overview of, of the ways in which a place, you know, changes over time with really good focused uh, discussions about, you know, different important aspects, right? About the differences between pilgrim, pilgrims, tourists, religious creatives, about the energy and, and, and the spatiality of the site, um, politics of the site. I think politics, of course, permeates, you know, everything. And, you know, has a great title too. I know we talked about that title. You definitely wanted to call it Vertigo, you know? <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just, it's just a wonderful, a wonderful book. And, and, and I'm so grateful for you to, to, to have published it in the series. Um, and I didn't even mention the whole scandalous chapter with the priest know, loaded right? up in jail. And anyway. Yeah, I mean, we, we could talk about that too. Let me see <laughs> if there are questions that we could, you know, fill up some time with that. That's, that's true. Um, are there any questions? Did anybody post anything? I, don't, I didn't see any in the Q&A. Um, uh, you know, if you do, just, just write some in. I mean, obviously, some of my students wrote some, some nice uh, questions as well. Um, but I don't see one that I, that, that had a good question. Um, I've, 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 uh, kind of, uh, addressed several, but you know, one of the things, what about the politics of the place? I mean, what about this? Do you want to talk a little scandal a little bit or, uh, yeah, or I can a little bit. So, um, I did most of my field work there from, for my dissertation from 97, 98, 99. And I didn't have a chance to go back again until 2003 and then again in 2006. And in the meantime, um, one of the things that happened was tourism had become such an overwhelming force there that uh, the treasurer of the diocese, who is now deceased um, and who, you know, this was all public, um, decided that the best way to handle tourism was basically if you can't beat them, join them. Mm -hmm. So he was responsible in the 90s, I was there for this, um, completely gutting and reworking this medieval building that was a museum. So it had started out as this little medieval, you know, building with a few sacred objects. Rocamadour was sacked and it lost a lot of its sacred objects, so they borrowed a bunch from other places. But um, he decided it needed to be a deluxe, hyper-modern, glass-filled, you know, modern, modern museum. Well, modern kind of thing. Right. So they gutted it. They put all this glass in. They had litanies to the Black Virgin on the speaker in there. And um, it was very expensive to do. And nobody came because they were charging more for tickets as a result. Mm. And his whole thing was, this is going to be a great money maker, And it wasn't. But he had another idea. Um, he decided that they were going to get together with the folks at the Bird Park and they were gonna have um, a, a multimedia spectacle called uh, Tell Me Falco, Falco being the name of a falcon. And this would be a falcon who was thousand years old and had been living since the time of Rocamadour's early pilgrimage, who would tell the story of you know, the, the pilgrimage and the history of the region, but there would be live actors and live music and there would be a video that was the child talking to the falcon. I never got to see this and I regret it because it would have been really interesting. Um, but it was gonna be this big deal. And the perfect thing was it gets really, it, it gets dark really late in the middle of the summer in Roque Madur. Um, usually after, you know, in June, it's like until 11 o'clock at night, it's still light out. And so people would go and then drive home. And he wanted to have a spectacle that would start after dark so that um, it would end and people would be forced to stay in hotels. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and that would increase the number of people staying there. It would increase the economy. Um, everybody would benefit. And so it was going to be this great connection between the secular and the religious and tie the pilgrimage in with the tourism and it was gonna be amazing. And um, it was delayed. Actors who were supposed to be paid were not paid. He was taken to court because of that. And um, that caused a problem. They also had the castle at the top was a place where priests in the 1990s lived. And if you came with your diocese, they had rooms for um, groups. So it was basically like a large group of pilgrims, say a group of 50 pilgrims, they could stay there, there would be breakfast for them. Um, they would come and go back and then they'd have dinner with the priests and this kind of thing. And um, they, he decided that that needed to stop and it needed to become a hotel restaurant um, just so any person who wanted to could reserve a room there. It mm -hmm. wouldn't have a religious character to it anymore. And um, the dining hall wouldn't be used for, you know, staff meals and priest meals. It would be used for as a restaurant. And that was apparently a real disaster too, because people wanted it to be like a hotel and they wanted to go out and come back after dark and have their own key and it just didn't happen. And so these three failures of decision-making combined with his apparent moving money that wasn't his from one account to another and back and forth um, meant that he ended up being um, arrested and taken into custody for fraud and jailed. And the new bishop who came in shut everything down. Right. So um, when I came back in in 2003, the only diocesan or diocesan business was the pilgrimage store because that was the only one had, that had been turning a profit. But there were no tour guides. You couldn't, um, you know, you couldn't stay at the castle. You couldn't do anything. There, the, it just shut down. And there were a lot of paid tour guides who were laid off at that time. And it was this massive sort of economic depression that came to the area. And um, it took many years to sort of revive that as a result. I think it's a good, that's a good kind of um, illustration of how, you know, tourism and, and pilgrimage development isn't a, a catch-all, you know, solve every problem. I mean, it, 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 it's very tenuous and it's, and it's funny how anthropologists and other social scientists, we look at it one way and then you have some other disciplines which are always touting this this great you know way of making you know economic uh, stability which you know through development like this and it's just not you know um i'll do one more question since i don't see any because but this was a common one and you answer the way that you want to i guess but your position your own positionality right um how does that affect uh, your research as an anthropologist, uh, your research with and among pilgrims. I mean, I, you know, I'm I'm pretty open that I, you know, I am a, I'm a practicing Catholic and, and my family's from, you know, we have connections with the saint that I study. And so it's been always uh, to my benefit, you know, I've used it to my benefit too with, with, with the pilgrims. And they said, oh, I could see you're really, you know, you're really praying. You really know, you know, you know your stuff. And to me, that was a great way of of being one with them and really, you know, uh, doing the participant observation. Um, can you speak a little bit to your own positionality? Sure. Um, I don't think it's going to be super helpful. Um, I, what I would call a devout agnostic, um, raised that way. So my mom who raised me, her, uh, her position, I've seen a bumper sticker uh, that said militant agnostic. I don't know. And you don't either. <laughs> so that is sort of how I was raised mm -hmm. at the same time. And this is maybe going to sound a little weird, but I'm like really empathic where um, I get what people are telling me. Like this has happened more than once where I go up to talk to somebody on pilgrimage and they are moved by what they're doing, they start to cry. And then I start to cry, but I don't know why we're crying. So <laughs> I'm just really like connect to people's emotions and, and sincerity. So essentially what happened for in terms of my positionality is that I would be sympathizing and understanding whoever I was talking to at the time, which is really useful. Um, it meant that I connected really well. Um, it meant that I was not dismissive of anybody's position themselves. It meant that when I was with the Catholic nuns, I completely got where they were coming from. 
Um, at least I think I did, you know, it's, it's, how do you know, but okay. um, I felt that connection to them and that kinship with them. And then I would go and be with the, um, you know, the earth-based folks or the energy folks. And my dad, um, who didn't raise me, but he was like constantly doing astrological charts and doing numerology. And he taught me tarot cards. And so I knew my way around that stuff <laughs> and could relate to it and understand it. And then when I would talk to the very atheistic folks, I would kind of like, I get that mindset. Yeah, this does, you know. Mm. And so it would drive me crazy a little bit. And I had, um, I mean, it wouldn't drive me crazy, but it, there was this constant shifting, which I was mostly comfortable with. But I had one um, interlocutor who was a British woman who had converted to Catholicism and was very, very doubt, devout and would come and speak to me in English. And she was very upset that I was there she would say things to me like, um, I just hate it when people study religion as though it was some kind of insect. Sure. I mean, but I don't mean you. <laughs> and she was the one who told me that I couldn't understand what was really going on unless I did convert. Mm. So she would have been a big proponent of um, what has been called methodological theism. But when you're interacting with different populations with different beliefs how do you embrace methodological theism so even if I wanted to do that which really wasn't my plan it would be completely impractical in a place where there's so many contested interpretations sure. sure yeah no that's that's no I think that's a great answer because I mean you know how do we <laughs> it, I think we have to be just like any tour guide to we have to, if you want to be a successful anthropologist, first of all, you obviously have to share empathy with people. I think, you know, we've learned from the past kinds of uh, ethnographers, the colonial ethnographers, that yeah. really the empathy and the seeing ones and recognizing others' humanity uh, is is key here. Um, but also, of course, you you should be able. I mean, we're trying to be two people at once too. We're trying to be a participant and uh, an outside observer, right? So, so all of that is difficult and sometimes it is difficult, uh, you know, for anybody, right? It, whether you are a pilgrim, whether you believe in this, whether you don't, it doesn't matter, right? Because you're trying to, 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 to play all sides here a little bit. Um, you get vertigo just thinking about it, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is another reason for that. No, I had to have that word in the title because there's so many dizzying things. It's That's dizzy right. Thing. So what, what's the last, uh, we, we, we have to end now, and, uh, but uh, what's, what's, what's next on the docket for you? Where, where are you, what are you gonna be studying here? I am continuing to study religious aspects of space exploration. Um, I'm fascinated by what uh, uh, Frank White has called the overview effect, which you're gonna catch the connection here, which is when astronauts see the earth from space and get overwhelmed with awe and in some cases have a religious experience. So if you think standing next to this giant cliff that's up and down is something, imagine doing an, a, a spacewalk with the earth doing that same kind of thing to you. Um, I'm very interested in how people's experiences of physicality um, input their religious beliefs. One of the things that I find interesting is when I talk to space people, uh, or how, how do I put it? People interested in space. There is a very strong sense that it's an area of science. There's no religion taking place in space, that these are all scientists who understand facts and would never believe in anything. And that's not the way humans work. So when you go and you talk to astronauts, you talk to physicists, you talk to astronomers, um, I spent a month living at the Vatican Observatory. These are oh, awesome. astronomers, right? The, the, they combine both of those viewpoints and they reinforce each other in interesting ways. Um, that this approach is the idea that everybody's an atheist in space. It, it's an unrealistic thing even to, to wish because humans are humans and religion, I believe very strongly is part of what makes humans humans. Right. Um, so I'm working on a book, um, especially, you know, hopefully this summer I'll get a chance to spend some time doing that. Mm -hmm. And um, I know you're always going to get me a little bit more into space tourism. So I'm working on that as well. Sure. Um, but right now it's, I've got 
40 something interviews with a number of people involved in space exploration, including 10 astronauts and um, sorting through interviews and putting this all together to kind of get a picture of what that looks like. Well, that's great. Well, well, thank you. And I have to say, I mean, your, your, your chapter in, in a different book, you know, of mine, uh, the seductions of pilgrimage, uh, you know, really was eye opening. Yeah. Yeah. God's great cathedral. Your chapter is one of my favorites in that book. Uh, and, and, and that is my favorite volume. I think uh, I've done not with this series, but, um, you know, well, but you, 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 you show that. how these astronauts, the majority of astronauts are, are, have, have a, a sense of faith, you know? Um, I don't know if I can say the majority, but not the majority. I would, I, that would be my guess. I mean, I don't feel I haven't done a survey. I haven't seen anything like that, but I would feel comfortable saying that it's likely. Yeah. I've I've interviewed a couple of atheistic atheist sure. astronauts too. That's a tongue twister. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, this uh, the book is a sacred vertigo pilgrimage and tourism in Rocamadour, France. Uh, Dina Weibel, thank you so much for being here uh, with us. You know, best of luck to and buy the book. It's great. And um, we will see you. We have one more uh, for this, this session. We're going to be looking at tourism development in India. We're going to take a different tact where, where the, the, you know, the author, Natalia Block, does uh, talk about some of the positives and the benefits as well of, of this. And, and thanks. And thanks to all those who, who joined in. Thanks, John. I see you there too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. And thanks to everyone for attending. Sure, thanks.